Welcome, I'm Dr. Uma Krishnamurti, the chair of the Research and Current Concepts Committee. The members of our committee will today present a roadmap on how to prepare a poster and a platform presentation. The members of our committee review all the posters and the platform presentations in the annual meeting of the American Society of Cytopathology and uh, together decide the award recipients. The various awards that are given out in the annual meeting are Quality Improvement in Cytology Award, Gino Sakamano, New Frontiers in Cytology Award, Advances in Thyroid Cytology Award, the Cytotechnologist Scientific Presentation Award, Dr. Warren Lang Resident Physician Award, the Innovative Cytotechnologist Practice Award, and Dr. Bernard Naylor Cytomorphology Award. Today's presentation, we have several of our members and the overview of the presentation will be planning the project by Dr. Diana Ng from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, executing the project by Dr. Songling Zhang from McGovern Medical School, writing the abstract by Dr. Caitlin Sunling from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, preparation for a poster presentation by Dr. Daniel Elliott Range from Duke University, Preparation for a platform presentation by Dr. Mishia Nishino from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And finally, writing the manuscript by Dr. Jonas Hyman from Cornell Medical College. Without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Diana Ng. Okay. Hello everyone. So my name is Dr. Diana Ng and I'm an assistant attending at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And today I'll be talking about how to plan a research project. The outline for today's talk is first how to find a topic, the importance um, of mentorship, some reminders about the IRB uh, statistics as well as uh, some budget issues to consider. So the most important thing about planning a project is content, content, content. It's very important that you pick a interest, uh, topic that you're very interested in. And if you don't actually have any ideas, um, it's a great idea to meet with a potential mentor. And you can just have a brainstorm session, try to identify something, maybe you've read a paper recently or they've read a paper recently. And then finally, identify a project that is very uh, well-defined. So either a hypothesis-driven project or one that is a well-defined observational or descriptive study. In choosing a topic, remember to ask or consider, what's the hypothesis of your study? What's the innovation? Are you looking at something new and it's entirely novel and hasn't been described? Or are you kind of reinventing or kind of putting a new spin on something that's already been published about? And then what's the current literature? So it's very important to do a literature search in PubMed, um, your mentor can often point you in the right direction, uh, offer you a few initial papers to look at, or uh, many institutions have a librarian that can help you with PubMed if you're unfamiliar with that process. What are the specific aims of your project? What are the methods and are they feasible? And then in terms of the methods and then what you're supposed to do, what is your exact role and what are the expectations? Uh, when these things are outlined up front, often you can break this endless cycle um, as opposed to going to your mentor, getting a lot of feedback and then having to rehash ideas over and over and over. And so choosing a mentor is incredibly critical. Um, choose someone um, or even a team who you work well with. And a mentorship relationship is a commitment for both parties. So both the mentor and the mentee. And it's important to establish expectations early on. For example, how often will you meet? Do you want a hands-off or hands-on style? How much guidance do you need or independence? So these are important things to discuss at the onset of your project. So characteristics of a successful mentor include 
first interest in serving as a mentor, expertise in the area, and then the mentor shouldn't be overcommitted so that they have some flexibility in time and are able to commit to the time that uh, is required to finish this project. And also they're able to provide constructive feedback throughout the process and offer solutions to any obstacles that you might encounter. Characteristics of a successful mentee um, include someone who's able to clearly define the support that they need and the help that they need um, at certain steps of the project. Um, it's also important for the mentee to recognize that one person can't necessarily help you in every single part of a project. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to have a team or maybe bring um, a consult, uh, bring someone who's a consultant on. And also recognize that if it's something like a bigger project, your needs uh, for mentorship may change over time. Um, it's also very important to be able to accept and work through meaningful criticism. Um, it's not something personal. It's really just about uh, making the project as good as possible. Um, also, a mentee needs to be able uh, to be uh, it needs to be interested in working with mentors. Uh, and then you have to recognize that they're really there to help you grow. So in terms of constructing a mentorship team, you know, think about who you want your research mentor to be, maybe you need an additional content expert depending on your project. And occasionally, um, but not always, you might want an external mentor as well. So incredibly important um, is submitting your protocol to the Institutional Review Board. Every research project needs ethical approval. Um, some institutions um, offer things like an umbrella protocol, which your project uh, might already fall under. Um, this is something to ask your mentor. Um, and depending on your institution, um, sometimes the project, um, uh, the project can be submitted for an expedited review, an exempt review, or um, it might need a full review, which will take more time. Also incredibly important is the need for a statistical consultation. For example, you wanna think about the sample size or your methods before you start your project and not after. Um, this will save you a lot of headache um, as uh, many of us who've done uh, projects know. Um, and also during the project, you'll you'll also likely need statistical support. So remember to budget that in. And a lot of institutions have a statistical core where they offer one hour free, where you're able to consult with a statistician in the process of planning your project. And then think about your potential costs. Um, so the IRB at some places does require uh, some sort of fee. Um, what kind of testing do you need? Immunohistochemistry, um, molecular testing, uh, statistical help. Some places will charge for, for pulling blocks or pulling slides. And sometimes um, if you need assistance in chart review, that can also uh, be a recharge fee. And then of course, expert consultation, um, depending on what you need. So these are all things that you need to consider for your budget, which um, your, your department may have, uh, but sometimes you will also need for, uh, to look for external funding. So, uh, so thank you for listening to my talk. And so we'll go on to the next topic, uh, which is carrying out uh, the actual project. All right, so I'll see, I'll get this started. Okay, so as I said, is I'm gonna talk about how are you going to carry out the research project and after you select your topic and then plan your project and then the most important thing to carry out the project and name. So the topic then based on many years, their experience for work with our fellows and the resident. And uh, so the, the first most important thing I feel like and for over the years is the timelines as a uh, resident fellows and I have to define because the most important thing, you can separate your project into different small parts and then define the timeline for each individual part. So this way you can make sure and then your project can finish on time. So I emphasize this very important as the first slides because over the years we see have a, a nice research project and everything planned well 
but at the time, and then all the internet part, the mentee and the mentors, and at the end, could not work out their time. So it's important to discuss with your mentor to make a workable plan. And then, so divide your work into several small part of segment. So such as if you're looking for the charter review or case review, when do you want to finish? And then, so when you want to put out a slide or block for the research, for the email, and then when that can be done. And then, so how to, when is the time to review all the data? And then, so when is the time to discuss all the information you collected? So also the make sure you plan extra time for any unexpected delay. If your research the time span in the summertime, and make sure you put the all the personnel maybe involved in your research for positive for the summer vacation, like the research tech, and then the people who are doing the immunos. So the second and most important thing, as we talk in the first part, is HIPAA regulation. You have IRB approval. It's important. But during the entire research, the HIPAA regulation, you must keep in mind. So you use as little protect health information as possible. And then you should avoid to use any personal computer to store the research data, the patient information. You should avoid sending mass email among all the people in your research group because any leaking, we're gonna have a massive leaking of uh, protected health information. So whatever list in your research protocol, in your data collection sheets, you should be carefully followed. You should not deviate from what you write in your protocol. If any deviation from the research protocol, make sure you make the change before you take the action. So we always say it's important to remove any unnecessary PHI information from your data sheet. And then it's also carefully protect all the partial or fully patient protect information during your research. A lot of time we see their case, surgical case number, cytotic case number, those are considered as the information people can trace back to the patient. So all those data you have, patient case number, or any medical record number should be carefully stored. So right now, over the years, and then we emphasize a lot of those minimally invasive procedure. So right now for the research part we face today will be what the material can be used for the research, what the material should be reserved for the diagnostic or therapeutic for the patient. It's the most important thing I want to emphasize to every single fellow resident, even the faculty member, to concern of this in your mind and very importantly to preserve the material for any later on related really patient care. So the diagnostic material is most important for your consideration. And then if the recent specimen, recent tissue, cytology tissue, and then it should be considered, you know, their therapeutic diagnostic purpose first before we use anything for the research. And then I also say research material. And then if some research is designed specifically for the research, and then you can use it for the research, otherwise preserve the material for the diagnostic purpose. So the cytotic slides, we say it's not like a surgical material because the smear on the slide is not a reproducible. So you should be very careful about 
during the research period of time. And then to keep in mind in the, all the materials saving in the slide, you need to be have uh, the temperature, the environment, and to make sure you don't damage those materials because those materials may be needed to for molecular test from the slides. So the tissues are such as this tissue block that are very sensitive to the humid, to the temperature, keeping in mind the paraffin block can be melted. So if you have the paraffin block pulled in your office or some other place, make sure the temperature stored in the place can be safe for the material. So keeping in mind the tissue, once they cut, those unseen slides, the tissue on the slides is unstable. So a lot of time your research is based on the old unseen slides. So keeping in mind your result might not be adequately reflects the true of the tissue because of the tissue degeneration, and then this, which also affect the molecular test. So the data collection, and then I saw over the years, so when the project started, so without careful consideration, so during in the middle or almost finished, you find out you are missing some information you really needed for your study. And then you have to go back to all the way to the beginning to relook the chart again, collect your information. So make sure you do have a careful plan when you're collecting your data. As I've been emphasized before, you use the minimal PHA as needed for your study. So, and you should objective collecting all the information without any subjective interference. What that means, a lot of time when we interpret the data, when we collect the data, and then we intentionally, because you have your hypothesis, you know what you're looking for the result. You may be blinded or maybe abased by the, ex the result, what you expected to during your collection of the data. So use RB approved, as I mentioned early, the collecting data sheets, and then make sure you exactly follow. If you have any deviation, make sure you make the modification as for RB approved for your modification. So we talk about the result and interpretation. So you have to clearly define the category, the criteria, especially when we do the retrospective study, a lot of time the cytology diagnosis may be descriptive even for the surgical diagnosis. So you have to clearly define before you collect the information, the result put in their category as what you define. And then you have to clearly to lay out and see what is the original diagnosis, what is the review diagnosis, and then what is the consensus diagnosis. So the original diagnosis could be definite diagnosis, could be described diagnosis. And then if you want to put in a category for a described diagnosis, you have to follow your category definition. And then so when we review the slides or review the immunohistochemistry, so you have several options. You have blind review, make sure it's truly blinded, you're blind away by clinical information or the diagnosis. And you have a group consensus review that means you have two, three people look at the slide and then get a consensus. And then, so you have a group, but an individual review. That means you don't sit together, you look at the slide in a different time. And then you look at their diagnosis, review the information. So the quality control is very important for the research material. That's one of the most important thing we see so the people can repeat your result, can get the similar diagnosis and depend on the quality control of your research. So the statistical analysis, what always say, you have a data collection and they have all the different software, or you have the people who is good in their analysis and in part of your team. So it's very important to have the people who is good in the status analysis 
and then to look at the data carefully, and then to draw any conclusion. So you have planned your research, you worked very hard, and then at the end, so the result may not be your expect to be, or the result may be all negative. So those are the things I'm going to talk to because a lot of time we see their fellow resident and then spend hours, days working on a project. And then with the result, say there's no significant clinical importance or the statics analysis show no significant. So it's always needed to know, and then if your case number is enough to generate a powerful a result to give you your significance. And then, so also if you have failed anybody or if any method, what do you plan to use? And at the end, they're failed. Do you have any alternative way to do once there anybody or method failed? And then, so if you have an unexpected result for HC, the morphology, and then what does that mean? A lot of time we see unexpected result, let's see TTF1, you're thinking will be only positive in the lung adenocarcinoma. But if you see something, let's say like right now, we know in the mass network adenocarcinoma in ovary, they're clearly positive. So the unexpected result is not an un it's not necessary to be wrong. And then maybe the point that you find a new findings and then to have uh, published for people to know that it can be expected in the cases. So if your study comes out of negative result, I mean, so nothing is useful, you think. So the negative result not always mean it's negative. So we now it's very hard to get published or have all the negative result, but sometimes the negative result may be important for the, the medical community to know. The positive result, but your result contradicts the current literature, and that's important too. If you check all your research quality, antibody protocol, Everything is correct, and then the result is different from the literature, and then you have to look into what is the reason. Maybe you use a different antibody, maybe you use a different tissue, and then maybe that indicates something important for us to other people to know too. So thank you, Dr. Zhang, and I'm really excited to talk to you about how to write an abstract. I'm Dr. Caitlin Sundling from the University of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. So when you have your work underway, you're working very hard on your project, you hopefully are starting to think about how you're gonna share your wonderful work. Um, and starting with that, uh, submitting your abstract to a scientific conference is a great way to do this. Um, first, you're gonna to wanna to start taking a look at what scientific conferences are out there. The American Society of Cytopathology is obviously a great place to share cytopathology research. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to identify conference deadlines and then consult with your collaborators and mentors on an appropriate timeline so that everyone has a chance to contribute to your project um, in time for the conference deadline submission. Uh, accepted abstracts are often published. So this is actually a really great way to get your early preliminary research out there. Um, work in progress is expected in a conference abstract, but you may wanna think about um, what data you might wanna avoid sharing if it's too preliminary and it may change with additional work that may be done by the time of the conference. This is a great time to start considering your author list. Um, and don't forget any support staff who were really integral to the project and anyone um, whose help you're really gonna be needing in analyzing the data. Um, and then you're gonna wanna review the abstract guidelines for the conference to make sure that you have a good idea of what's required. Remember that your goals in submitting an abstract is, is that you're not, you're not trying to be comprehensive. You're not gonna be able to convey absolutely everything that you did and every important result that you had. Um, this needs to be su succinct and 
Um, it should establish the background and the importance of your work, but it should just give the reader a taste of your amazing work. So it really should leave people wanting more. And this has two purposes. One is the abstract should hopefully lead to your work being accepted for presentation, either as a poster or as an oral presentation at the conference. And second, when your abstract is um, published in the abstract book, this should lead people to want to um, come to see your presentation, whether it's the poster or an oral presentation. It should leave people wanting more and wanting to come and ask you questions and learn more about what you're doing. When you draft your abstract, you're gonna to wanna to consider using Google Docs or some kind of other online collaboration for drafting or editing so you can get your mentor and any other important people involved um, early on in the process. It's very likely that you're gonna start out with a, a document that's too long. I would encourage you to keep a copy of this long version. It'll really come in handy later when you wanna write this up for publication. You should know that citations and references are not required for an abstract, um, but this is a great time to start compiling your references because you're going to be doing some background reading um, and you, uh, you can kind of save yourself some work up front uh, by, by doing a little bit more up front, uh, compiling your references in a reference management software such as Zotero, EndNote, or Mendeley. Your conference may provide headings that can really provide a helpful framework in drafting your abstract. So it's a good point of entry to scientific writing. If you feel a little overwhelmed by writing an entire research paper, an abstract is a good place to start. You're just gonna to wanna to write one to two sentences for each heading. Your background should include your aim or hypothesis, your uh, brief descri description of your methods, your key results and conclusions. Um, you really have a limited amount of space, so you're gonna to wanna to stick to the most most important points. You should consider adding a figure or table if that's appropriate to your work. Um, this has two purposes. Um, one is that it really draws attention to your abstract when it's published in the abstract book. Um, you can see a nice example here from the ASC 2020 meeting where a very nice morphologic image was included with some annotation. You can also include a data table or a graph or chart. Um, this also conveys a lot more information and it can actually save you some words when you're writing up your abstract so you can convey more information in a more limited word count. Um, it's important to keep in mind that some conferences may include a word count penalty for figures. So if you're getting right up to the word count limit, your figure may actually detract a little bit from uh, uh, the number of words you can include, but usually this is worth it because a figure can, uh, can convey so much more information. And in working on your abstract, you wanna edit that a lot. Um, you're probably gonna be doing a lot of editing to keep it under the word count, um, but you're gonna be working on distilling it down to um, the most important and the most tantalizing parts of your work. In finalizing your abstract, proofreading, it, proofreading is really important. Um, you, this is a good way to utilize your co-authors, um, send it around, get as many people to proofread as possible um, to catch any errors. And then you do need to notify your co-authors if any acknowledgement or approval forms are necessary. And then be sure to send your co-authors the final version that you submitted for their records. And then hopefully with all of this, you will be successful in getting your abstract accepted and you'll have the opportunity to present your abstract at a conference. The next part will be presented by Dr. Danielle Range and will be creating the poster to display your work. Thank you, Caitlin. Let me just share my screen here. My name is Danielle Range. I'm in the Department of Pathology at Duke University Medical Center, and I'll be talking about designing a scientific presentation, uh, excuse me, poster. So we like to think of designing a scientific poster as a giant or life-size version of uh, your abstract. 
And so it should have similar required elements. You should have a title, authors and affiliation, your introduction and background, which may also include your objectives and aims, a summary of your methods, results, conclusions, and references. A poster is a visual presentation, so layout is important. Use a simple, light-colored background in a basic, easy-to-read font, like some examples I've given you here. And consider whether your audience can see your poster from a distance of about five feet. Arrange your required sections into columns, and be sure your layout follows a logical framework for easy reading. And be sure to create some space in between uh, lines of text, as well as space between adjacent columns for more visual appeal. Use accents to highlight important points, but don't overdo it. Most authors recommend just two accent elements. Maybe you'll bold some text or highlight some text in a different color. And be careful in formatting your headers, subheadings, and bullets to be sure that it all makes sense and that your audience can follow along. Continuing with that concept of a poster being a visual presentation, content of course is important, but it should be brief. Choose a catchy title that can attract your audience. You may pose it in the form of a question or a provocative statement. Keep your methods short and concise. Use figures whenever possible to show some concepts. For example, you may use a flow chart for cohort selection or subject study exclusion. Most authors suggest to keep your figures and tables limited to five or fewer to summarize your research and use bullet points or short sentences as opposed to long paragraphs, particularly in your aims and conclusions. So here's an example of a poster that I took a picture of at a meeting several years ago. It's been purposely blurred to protect privacy and the title and authors have been deleted. But I think you can see here that this is a poster that's very text heavy. In the upper left column, uh, you can see these authors included their abstract. Now, unless your conference requires it, you really don't need to include your abstract in your poster because, right, your poster is your abstract in a more fleshed out version. So that could save on space. In the lower left-hand corner, they included an introduction, but then their results, which is shown here in some charts and graphs and tables, follow the introduction. So the flow is a little bit confusing. What I would have recommended in this scenario would have been after the introduction to go ahead and have your methods, results, and then include um, the pie charts and graphs and tables after the results header. And then to the far right, we see here in this far right column, there's several paragraphs containing multiple sentences for their conclusions. I might have paired this down to some bullet points with the one or two sentences for each conclusion. Uh, on another note, these authors did use some good spacing in between their columns and in between their paragraphs of text. In contrast, we see a poster here by one of my uh, committee members that is a little bit more visually appealing. There's adequate white space throughout the, throughout the poster presentation here. They have short sentences underneath each header. And even under the results sections, you see there's headings and subheadings that are logical. Under their results, they limited it to one figure and one table that has some concise information about their results. And then finally, their conclusions were summarized in three short bullet statements or sentences. And finally, a poster is a conversation starter. So be prepared. Practice your presentation so that it's succinct. It's not meant to be comprehensive and it should be limited to about five to seven minutes. When people stop by to look at your poster, be sure to engage your audience, make eye contact, stand to one side of your poster so people who are walking by can still see it and offer to do a quick presentation to those who may have gathered in front of your poster. But also be ready for questions. Have other data on hand and at the ready in case questions come up. 
one of the things that I like to do is withhold a little bit of information on my poster so that I can elicit some questions from my audience. Now, of course, that information should not be central to your conclusions, but it may be some important or fun findings or interesting findings that were not central to your poster, but that may be information that you will be asked about. So it's always nice to withhold a little bit of information and start that conversation. Use your poster as an opportunity to network and connect with other people in your field. So be prepared with business cards or e-networking tools. Maybe you'll have a digital copy of your poster on your uh, smartphone that you can then share with people who stop by. And be sure to include your contact information on the poster. And that can be in the form of email or your social media handles. Finally, Proofread your poster and ask a colleague to do the same. You don't want any mistakes showing up. Practice your presentation and be sure to get feedback. And finally, have fun, meet people, and be sure to write that paper. These are some resources that the committee um, offered and some of the resources that I used in making this presentation. And now I'll pass it on to Dr. Nishino to talk about a platform presentation. Thank you, Dr. Range, and that was fantastic. So congratulations. You've just been invited to present your research project at a platform session. Now, whether you're a seasoned speaker or a relative newcomer to public speaking, following a few simple steps can help take your presentation to the next level and make it a memorable experience for both you and for the audience. And all of these tips revolve around uh, this central idea that there are two main goals for uh, your platform presentations. Number one, to educate the audience, and number two, to engage them. So that means for every slide that you prepare in your PowerPoint deck, ask yourself, I mean, does this information that you're putting on the slide educate the audience about your specific topic? And does it do so in a way that's engaging, in, the way, in a way that captures their, uh, the audience's attention and their curiosity? And over the next few slides, we'll discuss some strategies to help accomplish this. So first, clarity in the structure of your presentation is one way to provide that engaging content. And in general, the structure follows that of a conventional uh, scientific paper uh, that Dr. Sundling and Dr. Range talked about in their abstract and, and poster presentation. You start off with an introduction, present the central aim or question of your study, describe how that study was performed, present the results, and then discuss. And you should craft each section in a way that tells a logical narrative. Stories are engaging, so tell a story through each of these sections. And we'll start with the introduction. The introduction is the beginning of your story, right? It should take no more than two slides or so because you're providing only the information that is essential for understanding the purpose of the study. The introduction is not meant to be comprehensive and its sole purpose is to set the stage for that central question or aim of your study. And speaking of that central question, your presentation should have one dedicated slide that simply states the central question or aim of your study. And with this single slide, the audience should get a very clear picture of what the gap in our knowledge is that's crying out for your study to resolve. Next section, material and methods shows how you carried out that study. And like posters, uh, platform presentations are primarily a visual medium. So using uh, flow diagrams and cartoons can be effective at efficiently communicating uh, information in a really engaging way. And tools such as uh, PowerPoint uh, can be used to create both flow diagrams and cartoons. And there are online scientific uh, resources uh, such as uh, biorender.com uh, that can be helpful in providing some images as well. In general, the less words on your slides, the better. It, you know, when you have to use words, limit them to those bullet points uh, with short phrases or keywords as much as possible. Avoid long paragraphs and even complete sentences. Think creatively 
about how a diagram uh, can convey a process in place of words. And for most of your studies, having a one or two slides uh, should suffice for the materials and me methods section of your platform. The results section forms the heart of your platform presentation. And the key here is to display your data in the most straightforward and intuitive way possible. And software such as uh, Excel, PowerPoint, and GraphPad are great for preparing those clear and simple graphs. Now, if your data is very complex, break it down into simple digestible chunks, and it is so much more compelling uh, to show a sequence of several simple clear graphs that tell a story rather than showing a single complex chart that's loaded with data so avoid being in that situation where you have to show a a data slide a complex data slide where you have to preface it by saying you know i'm sorry you know, this is such a busy slide but yeah don't put yourself in that situation you're in the driver's seat when it comes to showing us your data so a part of your responsibility as the platform speaker is to break down that complex data into clear chunks that your audience can digest much more easily and along those lines uh, you can use free online tools such as rawgraphs.io to find a ways to display complex data in visually compelling and intuitive simple ways. And here's an example of an alluvial plot or Sankey diagram that we recently made for a, a study uh, using free online tools like uh, rawgraphs.io. Now, after presenting your results uh, in these visually impactful ways, your next slide will be your discussion. And for the discussion, it's helpful to circle back to that central aim or question remind the audience what that gap in our knowledge was and clearly state how your study bridged this knowledge gap. And once you get to the other side, use a slide to explain uh, the limitations of your study, the implications of the study on the field, and propose the next steps that uh, you or the field should take to follow up. And that's it. That's it from the standpoint of PowerPoint slide presentation. Now, in terms of delivering your presentation, I'm reminded of that old joke about a tourist uh, asking uh, a, a, someone in New York City, you know, how do you, I get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer, of course, was practice, practice, practice. And the roadmap for delivering a stellar and engaging uh, platform presentation is just the same. It's helpful to adopt the mindset that your platform presentation is a performance. And just like a musician will practice extensively for their recital, you need to practice for your platform presentation. Practice to the point where you don't need to rely heavily on notes. And in fact, you can use the prompts on your screen uh, to basically to serve as your prompts. Uh, you don't need a script. And also, you do not necessarily need to um, memorize your talk, uh, but consider memorizing at least your introduction and your outro so you can ensure a strong, smooth beginning and a very confident ending. Now, when you're delivering your presentation, running on time is key. You're staying within your allotted time is appreciated by your audience and fair to the other speakers and, and much valued by your session moderators who are striving to keep the session on time. So. While you're practicing, time yourself and aim to finish in about 80% of your allotted speaking time. So, for instance, if the platform presentation allots you a 10-minute time slot, aim for about eight minutes during your practice. During your actual presentation, we often go a little bit longer than uh, what we practice for. So, you know, aiming for 80% is a good rule of thumb to make sure that you can go at a comfortable pace and still have a safe cushion left over. And finally, just a couple of parting tips. You know, keeping in mind that a platform presentation is a performance opportunity. You can engage and captivate your audience by starting slowly and deliberately, you know, communicating energy and enthusiasm, and then building to that confident finish. And you know, I, I know that public speaking and platform presentations don't come naturally to most of us. So you know, if you, like me, fall into that camp, I highly recommend uh, this powerful TED Talk by the psychologist Amy Cuddy, who shares some practical advice about how something as simple as your posture can help motivate and, and psych ourselves up for that impactful presentation. So a, a link to that is shown here. So best wishes on your platform presentation. You know, we're all rooting for you and look forward to a stellar talk. 
And next up will be Dr. Jonas Heyman, who will share tips on writing that manuscript. Thank you, Dr. Nishino, for that outstanding presentation. Um, I want to move on to writing the manuscript. Uh, my name is Jonas. I'm one of the junior cytologists at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. And now that you have prepared a project, executed a project, submitted an abstract, presented your poster or platform, and perhaps even won an award at the ASC meeting, now you want to put it all together and write the manuscript. Before you begin, there are a couple of laws of academic writing that are important to remember. The first is the law of conservation of effort. A fixed amount of effort is required to adequately write and review a paper. Thus, the less effort the author puts in, the more effort the reviewer will have to. And law two is a corollary of law one, which is the law of diminishing returns. In other words, the harder I have to work at reviewing your paper, the less I will like it. It's also important to remember that academic writing is really hard. If you feel you're struggling, just know you're not alone now and you're not alone historically. Many people have struggled as well, but it can be fun as well as being challenging. It's important to set a schedule, have a timetable, meet deadlines, and make sure to confer with your mentor at every step in the process. It also, it's also very helpful to compile a library. You can do this in either PDF as PDFs or in EndNote or another site while you write software option. Uh, it's helpful to select key references to use as a primary template for when you're actually writing the manuscript. Also decide if your projects or if the data that you've collected are best represented as one paper or possibly two or even more. And remember that you don't have to start with any one particular uh, topic. If you plan to write more than one paper, for example, consider writing and publishing a review first to help organize your thoughts and help get some extra credit along the way. Next, you'll need to select a journal for submission, and there are multiple factors to consider when selecting a journal. One is the readership. Who will be interested in the topic that you have decided to research? The journals have different strengths in different research areas, and you'd like to select a journal that has strength in your specific research area. The impact factor can be important depending on what your goal is, um, but remember that impact factor alone is not the end all and be all of, uh, of selecting a journal. There are other bibliometric uh, measures as well. Cost is important, especially for trainees. Uh, you will or may have to pay a fee to publish in certain journals and the uh, certain journals charge for access to reading. So if you want a wide readership, consider the access to the journal that you're selecting. Finally, turnaround time. What is, what is the length of time you are willing to wait till a, the audience is able to read your research? Once you've selected a journal, make sure to download, save, and then actually follow the instructions to the authors. You may also wanna select key papers from your selected journal to use as a secondary template when writing the manuscript. Next, before you start writing, it's important to sketch an outline. You can do this in two levels. The first level is really a very thin skeleton of what you are going to write. You want to decide what is the importance of the topic? What is your hypothesis? Can you plate it, uh, state it plainly? Um, for your results, what will be best represented as text, best represented as tables, and what will be best represented as figures? And finally, what are the major findings? Once you've got this skeleton of an outline, you can move on to a more fleshed out outline. So for your introduction, why is your topic important? What is already known about the topic? And what specifically is your hypothesis or objective? For your materials and methods, how were patients or specimens identified? What parameters or outcomes were evaluated? What materials were utilized? And what statistical analyses, if any, were performed? For your results, you've got to decide which are the most significant and which are secondary, but still interesting that you would want to include in the manuscript. And finally, for your discussion and conclusions, what are the major findings and what are their significance and implications? 
Next, when you're actually writing, you've got to decide what order you're going to write in. Traditionally, people will start with an, by writing their introduction, and then they'll skip around between the materials and methods, the results, and the discussions and conclusions. A novel method that's been suggested to me in the past has been starting with the materials and methods, then moving on to the results, then the introduction, and finally the hardest part, which is often the discussion and conclusions. Remember that whichever order you decide to write in, you really should be writing your abstract last because that is really just a condensed version of what you've already written. Remember that the introduction and methods may actually be written before data collection is complete for the sake of time. Um, there are certain tips that you can use for the uh, specific sections. So for the introduction, remember, you really want to be brief. Um, you want to hit on the importance and centrality of the topic to your field of research. You want to highlight gaps or shortfalls in previous research and make sure to always clearly state your research question. For the materials and methods, it's a good idea to include subheadings. And what you really want to look for is reproducibility. Will the readers who are reading your manuscript be able to reproduce the experiments and perhaps the results that you have obtained? Remember that extraneous detail for most journals can be added in a supplement rather than in the, main, in the main text. For the results, make sure to follow the sequence of subheadings that were outlined in your method section. Make sure that your tables are concise, your photomicrographs are clear, and be sure to avoid interpretation or inference in the results section. That's really for the discussion and conclusions. And again, extraneous detail in terms of results can go in a supplement often. For the discussion and conclusions, you really want to explain the importance of and contextualize your major findings. For example, are there any alternative explanations for the uh, data that you've collected? You'd like to compare your results with those that have been previously published and make sure to discuss any discrepancies or unexpected findings. Sometimes you may want to add future directions, but be careful. If you suggest a future experiment, the reviewers may ask you to do it now. Finally, you'd like to package your uh, manuscript. References, which are extremely important, may be added at the end, or you may go with a cite while you write option. You will need to make a title page, and you will also need to revise. Remember to revise for content, style, grammar, punctuation, and consistency. There are several tools commercially available out there. One that's been recommended to me is Grammarly, which can be found at grammarly.com. And remember that for academic writing, among all forms of writing, plagiarism is really the cardinal sin for academic writing. So make sure that you avoid, avoid plagiarism and you attribute everything that you've taken from other sources correctly. Make sure to solicit and incorporate feedback from your co-authors. And you will also need to write a cover letter. In your cover letter, use a one-sentence synopsis to introduce the paper and highlight what makes the paper unique. Finally, you will need to respond to, most likely need to respond to reviewers' critiques. When you do, make sure to use temperate language and to meet the deadlines set by the journal. Remember that a good paper is easy to read, but it's difficult to write, so enjoy the journey. For the next few moments, I'll leave some references up on the screen. While you're looking at those, I will kick it over to Dr. Sanchita Roy Chowdhury at MD Anderson Cancer Center, who is the vice chair of our committee. And I'd like to thank Dr. Roy Chowdhury and Dr. Krishnamurti for putting this all together. On behalf of everyone here on the Research and Current Concepts Committee, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And I want to thank all of our committee members who came together to put this wonderful presentation in terms of putting together a project, a poster and a presentation, um, as well as how you write your paper and submit it to a journal. I um, want to thank Dr. Krishnamurti, uh, our chair for the committee who um, conceptualized this uh, project, um, which I'm hoping everybody finds super helpful. I've been taking notes as we went along because I found several helpful tips like um, that, were, that were presented today. And I want to thank everyone on our committee for putting this together. Um, a special round of thanks to Jamie, who has been instrumental in putting this together and organizing this. 
So thank you um, on behalf of ASC uh, for joining us today. And we sincerely hope that you will find some helpful tips that will help you put together your project. And we look forward to seeing your poster and presentation at the ASC annual meeting or some other scientific meeting that we will all hopefully be there either virtually or in person soon. So thank you very much.